And we ask this all in the, in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, I want to ask you this morning if you ever feel like your optometrist is mocking you. I don't know about you, but I, I show up sometimes and they project those letters on, on the wall and you start reading them and then they put that odd device in front of your face and they start making these adjustments and they ask questions like, which is better, one or two? And I don't know about you, but I feel all this pressure. Like, I don't know what the right answer is. Is it one or is it two? And, and I feel this pressure. I can't really tell a difference. And I wonder deep down, like, is my optometrist really mocking me? Like, there's not a difference between one and two and they're just seeing how long I'll go along with this charade, you know? But, but it turns out that that contraption and all those questions, which is better, one or two, they, they allow your optometrist to narrow down your prescription to one of over 9.2 million options. That's right, 9.2 million options. You walk into Foot Locker, they may have shoes in 50 sizes. You walk into your optometrist's office, they've got to get the right prescription from 9.2 million different options. And the right lens makes all the difference, doesn't it? I mean, without corrective lenses, I can barely see my hand in front of my face. I'm well beyond the definition of legally blind without corrective lenses. But you put the right lens in my eye, and suddenly my vision is restored, and I can see the world the way it is. The right lens makes all the difference. And um, that's why this morning I want to try to give you the right lens. Not, Not a physical lens to see through, but a spiritual lens through which you can see the world and begin to make sense of it. A lens that will allow you to to answer big and important questions in life. Questions like, you know, uh, what are the source of our problems in this world and how do we solve them? You know, are are our problems mostly because of systemic injustices or are problems because of a lack of personal accountability? Uh, Why why is it that our world is so divided? Why, Why do we break into groups and why do we point our fingers at one another and blame one another for all of our problems? What should my expectations be when it comes to work? You know, should, should I be able to find a job that is fulfilling? Those questions may feel like they have nothing to do with one another. There's some big questions, important questions, and what I want to try to demonstrate this morning is that if you view the world through the right lens, you'll be able to make sense of questions like those and more. And I'm going to argue this morning that the, the right lens through which we are to view the world is the doctrine of, of sin. That, that if, if you view yourself and the world through the lens of the doctrine of sin, n- not just that we're sinners in need of a Savior, although that is true, but if you come to understand what it, what it means that we are sinners and that our world is under the curse, how it will enable you to answer big questions like these. And so this morning, I, I hope that you will turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 3, as we consider the doctrine of sin and its implications for our lives. If you brought your Bible, turn there. If you've got a digital device with you, I'd encourage you to simply search for the ESV, the English Standard Version. That's the translation of the Bible I'll be reading from this morning. And so you can search ESV Genesis 3, and you'll be able to follow right along with me. Uh, I'm going to begin reading there in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, 
The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you've done? The woman said, I, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust. And to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever, and this is God's word to us today. And um, <laughs> this is quite the story, isn't it? Starts with a talking snake. It ends with a flaming sword that's spinning constantly in front of an angelic guardian who's guarding the entrance to a magical garden that contains a tree that if you eat the fruit of it, you'll live forever. It's like Indiana Jones and Ghostbusters smashed together. And so you might read something like this and think, man, this is crazy. Who in their right mind would believe this? But this morning, what I want you to see is that if this story is true, and it is, if this story is true, all of those things in life that seem so crazy and unexplainable, if you will view those things through the lens of Genesis chapter 3 and the doctrine of sin, all of those crazy and unexplainable things in life will suddenly begin to make sense. Now, that's the argument I want to make. And here in these verses, we see first what sin is. That sin is simply any transgression of God's law, any disobedience of God's law. Uh, God comes along and he says, hey, here is what is good and right, and we are to obey it. Adam and Eve were to obey it back then, we are to obey it today. But Adam and Eve back then, and let's be honest, you and me today, at times we say to ourselves, eh, I know what God has said but maybe my way's better. Uh, you know, here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, uh, the woman, she, uh, she looks at the, the fruit on this tree that God had told her not to eat, and she says, oh, it looks good to me. I, I don't see what, what could be harmful about it. And she trusts in her wisdom rather than God's wisdom. She disobeys God's law, and the Bible calls that sin. Sin is any disobedience of God's law. But not only do these verses tell us what sin is, they also tell us what sin does. That sin turns all of creation on its head. Adam and Eve are supposed to have dominion over the animals. They're supposed to be under the authority of God. But because of sin, rather than having dominion over the animals, Adam and Eve submit to an animal when they listen to the voice of the serpent and do what he says. And then they set themselves up above God when they believe that they have the right to be able to determine whether what God says is true or not. Adam and Eve were designed to live forever in the garden, in the presence of God, but because of sin, they will now die outside of the garden, away from God's presence. Uh, sin is any disobedience of God's law, and the result of sin is that all of creation gets turned on its head. And the implications of this reality are, are so many that we couldn't cover them all. We, we couldn't cover them all this morning. We couldn't cover them all if we spent 10 weeks. And so what I've decided to do this morning is to, 
to select three headings under which I want to I want to try to consider the doctrine of sin so that we might reorient our vision to see life the way we're supposed to see it through the lens of the doctrine of sin. And the first of these headings is is the doctrine of sin and the source of our problems and their solution. Because if you go out into the world, what you're going to find is those on the political left, many of them will say, hey, uh, you know what's wrong with our world is that we've got these systemic injustices. And if we're going to solve the problems in our world, what we need to do is we've got to, we've got to correct the way in which the environment in which we live, the, de- the deck is often stacked against many in our society. And so if we can change that, we'll, we'll solve the problem. Well, on the political right, you got, you got folks who, they'll say, if you want to know what the problem is in our world, it's that there's a lack of personal responsibility and accountability. People need to be people who face the consequences of their actions. They've made their choice, they got to live with it. Then you got people in the church, and, um, and, and what they often say is, look, uh, the ultimate source of every problem is sin, And the ultimate solution to sin is Jesus. And so if we're going to solve the problems in our world, we can't be distracted with any sort of social action or uh, physical assistance. We just got to preach the gospel, nothing else. And those are the primary options you see out in the world around you. But what I want us to see this morning is that Genesis 3, if we're looking at life through that lens, Genesis 3 will not allow us to select any of those options. Because, you know, those on the left, they'd look at Genesis 3 and they'd say, whoa, 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 whoa. How can Adam and Eve be counted guilty here? Look at the way in which the deck is stacked against them. What is this serpent doing in the garden that God has made? And, And why is there this tree, and of course it's in the center of the garden, why is the tree in the middle of the garden there for no purpose other than to trap them? And so they would say, look, uh, but because of the environment, the deck is stacked against Adam and Eve. The fault really isn't with them, it's with God. Those on the right, many, many might say, hey, um, Adam and Eve have made their choice. They knew what the consequences are, they got to live with them. They made their choice, they made their bed, now they got to lie in it. Uh, those in the church might say, look, Adam and Eve, they've sinned. What they need is, they need Jesus, they need the gospel. And so all they need is Jesus and problems will be solved. But I want you to notice instead what God does in Genesis chapter 3. In in verse 15, notice God does preach the gospel in a roundabout way to Adam and Eve. Uh, There in verse 15, as God curses the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Uh, This verse is known by theologians as the Proto-Evangelium, which means the first gospel. Because here, in in Genesis 3.15, we see the, the seed of this good news that a Savior will come. It's why if you look at verse 20, we're told, after all this cursing has taken place, the man, Adam, looks at his wife and names her what? Eve, which means the mother of all living. Now, why would he look at his wife after all of this and call her Eve? I mean, why wouldn't he call her death? She's brought death on them. She's brought death on the world. But instead, he calls her Eve, the mother of all living. Because Adam and Eve have heard the good news, even in the curse. There in verse 15. They've heard this curse, and they've thought to themselves, oh, Here's the good news. We're not going to die physically today, right here, right now. We're going to have offspring. We're going to have children. And one day, one of our descendants is going to come and and crush the head of the serpent, which Revelation makes clear to us is the devil himself. What they hear in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is that one day, one of their descendants will defeat the devil. And so God preaches the good news of the gospel to them. But I want you to notice that that is not all that God does. Look at verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. You you see what God is doing here. 
There's not only grace in the preaching of the gospel and the provision of a savior, there is also grace in the provision of clothing. Amen? God covers their nakedness. And, and if we begin to view the world through this lens, I, I just want you to feel how that ought to affect our lives. And so parents, uh, one night you may be sitting on your couch and all of a sudden at the door you hear, you go, you open the door, and there's a police officer there with your teenager in tow. And they've done something dumb. You know, not the officer, your teenager. And when you hear about it, it makes you angry. But not only does it make you angry, it, it, it makes you embarrassed. And then it's not long before you find yourself in a courtroom where your child sits in front of a judge. And at the end of that hearing, the judge hands down a hefty fine. What are you going to do in that circumstance? Like, you might be tempted to say, hey, the deck was stacked against my kid. The system is rigged. You might be tempted to excuse their behavior by saying, look, this really wasn't them. They were just with the wrong crowd, with the wrong kids, in the wrong environment, at the wrong place, at the wrong time. You might be tempted to excuse their behavior. On the other hand, you might be tempted to say, I can't believe you did this to you. I can't believe you did this to me. This makes me angry. It makes me embarrassed. I'm done with you, kid. I'm kicking you to the curb, and you're on your own. No more help from me. You got to figure it out on your own. You made your choices. You got to live with it. You might be tempted to think, what this kid needs is Jesus. And so you just start like preaching to your kid like every conversation is just come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. But, but if you look at the situation through the lens of Genesis 3, what you might do is you might say, you know what? Here in the text, God doesn't excuse the sin of Adam and Eve. Like they are responsible. There are some things that they can trip over in the garden, yes, but they are responsible for the decisions that they have made. They've got to face the consequences of those decisions. But I want them to know that there is hope in the provision of a Savior and that I stand here ready to help. And so maybe you speak to your child about the hope of forgiveness that is in Jesus, but then you reach into your pocket and you pay the first installment of the fine because you want them to know that there is hope in Jesus and that you're there to help. Or maybe you have a member of your family and like their life is a mess. And, and years ago, they went through something. I mean, they went through something tough. They have been through some trauma. They have been sinned against. And ever since that trauma, ever since that thing that happened, like their life is just one string of bad decision after another. And you might be tempted to think, you know, they're really not at fault for all this. If they hadn't been sinned against like that, if this hadn't happened to them, none of these other decisions would have happened. You just excuse their sin. Uh, you, you might, on the other hand, be tempted to say, you know, I can't believe they've made this decision. I, I need them out of my life. I, I can't be around them. I, I can't help them. They're gone. You might be tempted to just think, hey, they need Jesus. And so you just text them a Bible verse every single day. No other conversation. Just here's the verse. And you're praying one day it clicks. But if you view the situation through the lens of Genesis 3 and the doctrine of sin, you might think to yourself, you know, what happened to them was wrong, and that was rough. I don't know what I would do if that had happened to me, but they are responsible for the decisions they made. they got to face the consequences of them, but, but I want them to know that there is hope in the forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ and that I am here to help. And so you give up some of your time to help them fill out job applications and to prepare them for the interviews. You see how viewing the world through the lens of Genesis chapter 3 shapes the way we see the source of our problems and their solution. That, that we as the people of God ought to be there to speak of the hope that is in a Savior, but also stand ready to help. Not excusing behavior, not, not causing them to not feel the consequences of their actions, but there to be there to provide grace. Not only, though, does the doctrine of sin help us as we think through the source of our problems and their solutions. Secondarily, I, I want you to see the way in which 
If we view the world through the doctrine of sin, it ought to shape our expectations. Because one of the growing trends in our culture, and as a result, it filters into the church, is for people to expect to find fulfillment in their work. Uh, people don't just want to like clock in and clock out. They want to do something that means something, something that matters, something that has a, has a noble purpose. You've heard the saying, right? Do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. But is that a realistic expectation? More importantly, is it a biblical one? I mean, you, you flip back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, like flip a page or two in your Bible and and there in verse 15 of chapter 2, you'll see that the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. That means that in the Garden, in paradise, the perfect world, before sin, when God s- stood back and looked at everything that he'd made and said, this is very good, work was a part of it. And, and so th- this is the kind of work that we all desire. A work would bring the man fulfillment, meaning, and purpose. This is the work that we all crave because this is the work that we were all created for. It's why you desire fulfillment in your work. But notice Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Look at what sin has now done to our work. God tells Adam, because of your sin, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field, but you'll eat them by the sweat of your face. Sin has taken work that was meant to be fulfilling, and it has made it frustrating. And so if you're looking for a a job or a line of work where everything is joy all the time and fulfilling and nothing is ever frustrating, you are looking for a kind of work that does not exist this side of heaven. The work that you are looking for is in the new heavens and the new earth. It is yet to come. And if if you will look at at these decisions that you make, career choices, through the lens of Genesis 3, it'll change the way you make your decisions. And so high school seniors, young adults, you know, don't be paralyzed in fear that like, hey, if if I choose the wrong career, I'm just going to be miserable for the rest of my life. Like the good news of Genesis chapter 3 is that no matter what career you choose, there's plenty of misery waiting for you. (laughs) Like It's just coming your way. But, but the good news is that because we've been designed for work, there's going to be joy in it too. And so trust the Lord who is sovereign and good. And in his providential care, he will place you where you need to be. It means if you're here today and you're, you're working, but you're in a line of work and you're kind of wondering like, maybe I need to jump to another line of work. Maybe I need to find another employer. Like, you ought to think through that decision through the lens of Genesis 3. Because if you're in a job where, like, you can be content with, like, 70% of it, perhaps you shouldn't look for a place where the grass is greener because 70% may be about as good as it gets in this world. I mean, some jobs are going to be worse than others. Like, you have a particularly sinful boss... Life's going to be a little more miserable. You have, a, you have a righteous boss, a righteous company that makes decisions that are good and just and right. Well, work may be a little more pleasant. But 70% may, may be about as good as it gets this side of heaven. You see how an understanding of the doctrine of sin, it, it shapes our expectations in the world. Not only should it shape our expectations of things like work, it It ought to especially shape our expectations of ourselves and of others. And that's why the doctrine of sin is a tremendous source of humility. You know, uh, our world is becoming increasingly divided. We've seen it play out where groups split apart. They draw lines between themselves. They point fingers at one another and blame them for all of our problems. Have you seen what's happened in Congress over the past week? You know this to be true. 
But let's not kid ourselves into believing that this is only a problem that politicians face. All I've got to do is speak the word vaccine and like lines are already being drawn in this room. You know, we got people for, we got people against, people, you know, pointing fingers, ranting on social media, linking their article from their preferred expert, right? Pointing fingers and saying the problems with this world are you people who won't be vaccinated, problems are you people who will, you know, and it's just, it's going back and forth. I mean, let's be real. In some groups, all I got to do is ask the question, does pineapple belong on pizza? And we got a fight breaking out. Now, why is that? Why are we so quick to, to divide into groups, to draw lines and point fingers at one another? It's because that's the natural thing to do. It is the easy thing to do. When, when you believe that you are on the good side and they are on the bad side. When, when you believe that you can draw the line between good and evil between the two groups. But a doctrine of sin, it, it won't allow you to do that. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us has sinned in the past, but not only have we sinned in the past, each and every one of us continue to sin in the present. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. He says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. The Christian doctrine of sin doesn't, doesn't draw the line between good and evils out there somewhere in the world or between two groups. The doctrine of sin forces us to draw the line between good and evil within ourselves. There is good and evil within each and every one of us. And the more we are aware of that... The, the less likely we are to divide ourselves in groups and then point fingers across the lines and blame the other group for all of the problems. Because we understand that our group cannot be totally right and their group cannot be totally wrong. It, it creates a little bit of humility within us. For example, I mean, just, just think about the, the righteous decision of Wanting to correct another believer that you see in sin. You know, you, you see a s sinful pattern in their life. You love them. You want to draw near to them. You, you, you want to be an agent of their sanctification. You want them to grow in grace. But do you know the difference between a big sin and a little sin? As Tim Keller said, a big sin is one you commit and a little sin is one I commit. You see, the more we are aware that the line between good and evil has to be drawn within ourselves, not only will we question the motives of those in the other group, we'll also question the motives of those in our group and of ourselves. And so before we go to someone to correct their sin, it'll, it'll just put a check in us where like, is my motive really righteous? Because what we see in the gospel is that in order to correct our sin, it hurt Christ a lot more than it hurt us. And so if, if you're going to another believer to, to correct them of their sin, and it does not pain you, if the end result of that conversation is not that you are wounded in your spirit more than they are in theirs, something is wrong. Like, if you go with a, a sense of pride, like, look at me, I'm a good Christian, or you pat yourself on the back, or there is even some pleasure in you in going to correct them, like, you have got to stop immediately. If it doesn't pain your soul, you've got the wrong motive. You see, the right lens makes all the difference, doesn't it? And it turns out, the question, which is better, one or two, the, the answer is really, we need one, two, and three. Because not only do we need Genesis 1 and 2 that tells us who we have been created in the image of, how we have been created, what 
purpose for which we have been created, we also need the lens of Genesis 3 to tell us how we now exist here in the world. And if we see ourselves and others through the lens of the doctrine of sin, it will give us a greater level of humility. It will temper our expectations. It will help us to see with greater levels of clarity and wisdom the real source of our problems and the way we're to go about to solve them.